I say God is good all the time. All the time. We get it. God is good. God is good all the time, and he's always good. Hallelujah. But have you ever had somebody who, who is trying to discover the goodness of God and hasn't yet, which is, which is a lot of people, right? You know, there's a lot of people who do not understand the goodness of God. That blows my mind because of what I've seen God do in my life, the parts of God that's been around me, the way God has affected everything that I've, ever, that I've done, right? The, part that, the fact that he's been so much a part of my life for so long, it's hard for me to understand. There are people who don't know God is good. As a matter of fact, there are many people who think God is evil. There are. Do you know why? And, 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 and here's some of their, okay, some of the things they say about our God that kind of blows my mind. If God was so good, why is there suffering? You ever heard that? If God's so good, why is there suffering? Why would people suffer if God is so good? Why is there suffering? Well, let me, can I answer that for you? So really, can you do it? Oh, I got it. You know, how, you know where all the answers are found? <laughs> they're right here. Did you know they're all in there? Now, I've got a couple that I'm still looking to figure out. Called a pastor friend of mine this week and said, hey, not about this message, but a scripture I'm studying. What do you think about this? And you know what he told me? I don't know. So there's still some I don't understand, but the answers are in here. So why is there suffering if God is so good? And the answer is a complicated one and one that I'm going to take the next few minutes and I'm going to try to answer but I want to start with a very simple thing Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16 Genesis 3 and 16 starting from there oh let's just let's go I'm going to go with there with you I started it I like to open my new my new Bible because the more you open it and work it the better it falls open to the right page it was interesting I was studying something this week and I kept pressing that one page and then when I would flip back to it it would open to that page and I'm like it's breaking in <laughs> Oh, it's breaking in. All right, uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. You guys know what's going on there, right? Adam and Eve, they sin in the garden. First of all, they're in a garden. It's, it's roses and fruit trees and blessings and, you know, just beauty all the time and everything's perfect and they're in a garden and then, you know, they mess up. They eat of the tree they shouldn't have ate from. They took from the tree and sin entered into the world and sin entered the world and with sin came sorrow and pain. Right? I mean, that's, that's what Jesus said there. If you read in, in through that 16, it says, Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In sorrow, you shall bring forth children, and the desire shall be to your husband. He said to Adam, he said, said that thorns and thistles are going to grow. Hey, you, have to have to, you ever have to go weed your garden? Well, you can thank Adam. Go plucking the weeds out of your garden. Thanks, Adam. Did it again. Now, listen to me. Don't blame Adam, because I'm going to tell you something. I would have totally eaten from that tree when I was a kid. Okay, I'm just saying, if he wouldn't have done it, I would have. All right, I am not innocent. Okay? I, I would have been the one to mess it up. All right, so don't go getting hard on Adam, because I happen to know that you guys all have sinned too. Smile at me. Okay, so don't get mad at Adam. Now, he's just the first, but not the only. And because of sin entered the world, pain, sorrow, the, the, the frustration of that stuff has entered in. And so we have pain and we have sorrow because of sin. It wasn't how God imagined it. It wasn't, it wasn't how God wanted it. And it is not how it will be. Okay, in that next kingdom, it will not be. But right now it is because of sin. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Let's turn Matthew chapter 5. Uh, verse 44. Sorry, almost there. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. He said you have to understand something. God has the same 
e there are evil and good people all throughout the world. You think, well, why doesn't God then just stop having the good people have sorrow? Why can't the good people be set forth? And he said, God, you have to understand, God loves everybody. And he brings forth a consistency in the creation. And everybody's going to have sorrow. And everybody's going to have pain. And everybody's going to experience good days. And everybody is going to experience bad days. And sin is, the, the world has sorrow because of sin. It's in the world. And you're going to be a partaker of it. Shout hallelujah. You're going to partake of sorrow in the world, period. Now, st still, if God was good, couldn't he change it? Yes, he could change it. He could. We're going to keep going, all right? So it's interesting. People say, well, isn't the rain a blessing? Isn't the rain a blessing? It is a blessing, unless you work outside in it like I do. And, and I don't care how much rain gear you wear. If you've never had to wear rain gear and be outside in eight hours in a rainstorm, you should try it. It's fun. Ooh. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. You get soaked to the hand, and, and your hands are, my, my hands get so cold in the rain, and you're working out there in it. And, every, you know, there are people in the world who are blessed by it. They're being blessed by the rain. And then there's a few of us stiffs who have to be out there in it to perform our work and make our money to try to live, and, and, and it's a pain. Sorrow is in the world. Because of sin, you're in the world, we're going to experience sorrow. We're going to experience trouble. We're going to have hardship. The Bible says, in the world, you will have trouble. But I have overcome the world. You will have trouble. All right. So, so why then doesn't God take away some of our sorrow, though, right? I mean, we understand it's there, but I come to him. Why can't he just, just, why can't he just heal my sorrow? But I have a different question for you. John chapter 10, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Chapter 10, uh, verse 11. John chapter 10, verse 11. Why wouldn't God remove the sorrow? I am going to answer that question, but first, John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus speaking to them said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He that's an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not sees the wolf coming and leaves the, fl the sheep and flees. The wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. An hireling fleeth because he's, not, because he's a, a, a hireling and does not care for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I'm known of them. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, but them also I must bring that they hear my voice and shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore, does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again? No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received from my father. So I have another better question for you. Not why would God take suffering out and make, why would God not remove pain from our lives? Why would the creator God choose to suffer? Why? Why would the creator who spoke the worlds into existence, why would he choose to suffer? Not why does a good God allow me to suffer. Why would the most powerful being ever, 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 ever choose to lay down his life? Why would he choose to suffer? Because he's a good God. <laughs> He said, I lay down my life. So you can't, nobody's taking my life away. Nobody is taking it from me. I choose to lay it down. Some may say, why would a good God let people suffer? I don't understand why the powerful God would choose to suffer. I can't understand why he would choose that path. Why would he choose it? Turn to Isaiah chapter 53. I, I want to give you some scriptures. This was before Jesus. Isaiah 53. By the way, this is one of those, uh, if you've heard me speak before about, you can't, can't prove God. Well, you can. I can prove God. I can. You want me to tell you how? Some of you may have heard this and many of you have may not. How do you prove your shot in, when you're playing pool? You call your shots. Well, in Isaiah 53, and this was some thousand years or, or 1,500 years before Christ came, 
Isaiah wrote of what God Jesus would do. He called his shots. Well, that's proof because we know he did. And we know he came and we know he did what he said he did. But Isaiah 53 said, who has believed our report? And to whom have the arm, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow it before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when they shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He said, he is literally not going to be very pretty. You ever seen the pictures of Jesus, that handsome, young, strapping lad? Well, the Bible says he really wasn't that pretty. That's what it says. He was a common, he wasn't, he wasn't considered pretty. There was nothing in him that you would look at and see in him anything special. He said there was nothing in him. There was no beauty in him. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He said he is a man who gets despised. He gets rejected. He has many sorrows. He understood grief. A man of grief. And we hid as it were our faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we were healed. We were all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shearers dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, that he, is, that he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, he shall pleasure, that the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by the knowledge by knowledge shall my righteousness, so my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Who is this guy? Does that sound like somebody who's have a good life? I went through and just kind of underlined all of the d rejected and, and, and sorrows and stricken and the chastisements, and, and, and you use a lot of ink <laughs> to just point out that God said, now then you got to go back. You got to go back and you got to realize who we're talking about. The Bible says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You're talking about God himself. The Bible says that everything that was created was created by him. The word, Jesus, the creator of all things chose. When he told the disciples, I lay my life down, he chose sorrow. He chose pain. He chose to suffer. He picked and chose to take a part of the suffering of this world, having never sinned, having no obligation to do so, having no reason to ever experience pain, ever. He chose it. Yeah, God is still allowed suffering in this world, but he did not do it without being willing to allow his own self to suffer. He said, sure, he's a good God, one who's willing to suffer. Why would he do that? In Hebrews chapter 4, oh, this is a good one. Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, the scripture begins to talk about I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time going over all the, uh, uh, all, all the old law, but the priesthood and, and kind of going over that, the idea of Christ as the great priest. But Hebrews chapter 4 says, We have a great priest which is passed into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we do not have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but it was all points tempted like we are yet without sin. 
said, we have a high priest that stands before God for you. We have a Savior in Christ who understands all of the pain that you've experienced in your life. He stands before God, not as a creator God who, can't, who, who, who doesn't understand your suffering or your pain or the frustrations in your life. We have a high priest who stands before God who has experienced all of the things. The, 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 try that again. That he has experienced all the frustrations, the temptations that you've experienced. We have a high priest who understands your pain. You know, and, and I'm going to get to this in a second. Why can't God just take it away? I'm going to get to that. I am, I promise. But before we get to why God, why God just doesn't take it away, you have to understand it's not because he doesn't love you. His love for you is so deep that rather than see you, rather than see you in pain, how many of you at, with children, you would say, I would have traded places with my children? When they're in pain. Many times I see my kids. Man, I remember my, 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 my son when, when we were going through, he was having these breathing problems and we ended up in the hospital and he's in that little incubator thing and he's in there and you think, God, I would trade places with him. But let me go one better than trade in places. Would you be willing not to trade places but to go ahead and experience the pain at the same time even if they keep staying in pain? What if, what if trading places didn't mean they had to stop feeling the pain? What if trading places didn't mean they quit feeling pain, but instead you both got to feel the same pain? This is the place where Christ went to. This is the goodness of our God. Not a God who takes the pain out of your life, but a God who said, even though I do not take your pain out, and even though I don't have to, and even though there is no obligation for me to, even though I do not have to experience it with you, I want to experience the very pain that you are experiencing. I'm going to suffer with you. I'm going to suffer with you. Even if I can't take you out of there. Why can't he take you out of there? All right, we're going to keep moving on. Okay. Uh, Ephesians 5, 1, 5, 1 and 2. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed up here a little bit so I don't go long. I, I'm, I'm a little passionate about this. I'm sorry. Ephesians 5, uh, 1 and 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet smelling savior. So not only is he willing to suffer, but he's willing to sacrifice himself for us. Turn with me over to, uh, that was Ephesians, turn to Romans chapter 5, 8. Romans chapter 5, 8. Just, I, I just want to give you a few and then we're going to keep moving. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commanded toward his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though we were still sinners and didn't know him, he still died for you. He still sacrificed himself for you. All right, keep going. John chapter 3, verse 17. I know you all expected me to say 316, didn't you? John 3, 17. John 317 is, is, um, is uh, well, I'd say almost more powerful almost more powerful than John 3.16. You know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But in 3.17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now let's back up a second. If God chooses when we accept Christ at every time we call upon him or every time we come to know Christ. If he takes the pain away from you when you're saved and only applies the pain to the evil, then God begins to dispense judgment upon the world. And that's what we want. We would really like judgment on the evil. Why should I suffer if I'm good? I shouldn't. If God's good, then I shouldn't suffer because I'm good. We want God to bring judgment on the world. We expect, we want God to bring judgment, punish the evil, and bless the good. And in John 3, 17, he said he did not come 
to bring condemnation. He did not come to the earth to bring judgment. Oh, there's going to be a judgment and everyone will stand before the God and God will judge you and you will stand before him and some of you will go to heaven and some of you will burn in hell and there is a judgment day coming, but that day is not today. We are not under the judgment of God today. Somebody better shout hallelujah. Because if God would recompense judgment, then when, I, when my life was in sin, I would have got my just due, and I was due evil. Come on now. I deserved that punishment. But rather than punish me, God placed pain upon the entire world, and he left that pain upon the entire world, and the entire world feels the sorrow of the sin that I laid back when I was young and the sin that others have laid. We all experience it. It's by the grace and the very goodness and the love of God that he does not bring judgment on the world. Woo, come on now. Why would God allow good people to suffer? Because he's a very good God and he doesn't want anyone to perish. And because he doesn't want anyone to perish, he is holding off the judgment. Oh, it's coming. And those who mock God will pay and those who worship God will rejoice. And it is coming. Judgment day is coming. But Jesus said, I did not come to bring judgment. I came to bring salvation. I didn't come to heal every ache, pain, and sorrow you have. Somebody say, well, that's not right. Oh, he heals. Listen to me. Don't you believe? I know God is a healer, and I've watched God raise people out from the blind. I've seen God heal. Don't get me wrong, but I've also seen God say no. Well, that's not fair. Well, he's God. He can have it his way. Sorrow is in the world. And our good God chose to sorrow with us so he could bring us grace. So he could bring to us grace and give us this time, this place we're at, this time that we live to see men's hearts set free, to see the evil heart changed. God, don't bring your judgment yet. Instead, change the evil heart so that they can see the goodness of God and be transformed into the kingdom of light. Hold off your judgment for another day, God, so that those who are evil can be converted and learn who you are and find of the grace and the glory of God. It's God's grace that allows the world to exist as it does now with pain. It's his grace that allows that pain to stay. Because he continue, because his desire is that every last one of us can find the hope of our calling. Listen, he is going to do away with pain. He is going to do away with sorrow. He's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no pain. There will be no sorrow. There will only be rejoicing. And that day is coming because he is a good God. But he doesn't do it now because his grace is being poured out upon the world. And the answer is not, why does God let sorrow come to the world? The answer is, why would he choose to sorrow with us? And the only answer is pure love. The only answer is pure love. Pure love. One more scripture and then I'm done. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, verse 25. Verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7, 25. Whew. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he lives to make intercession for them. Speaking of Christ, he's able to save them. For such a high priest beca became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needed not daily as those priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sin and then for the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law makes men high priests, which have infirmity, but the word of, of, the, word of the oath, which was since the law, makes the Son who is consecrated forevermore. Now, 
via Dale explanation. He said, every priest under the law, first of all, the, sh without, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. What did Jesus say? Remember God, he told him in the, in the Garden of Eden, he said, if you eat of this fruit that day, you will surely die. And death became a reality in this world. Sorrow and death became a reality in this world. And that death is carried on and it's appointed unto every man to die. And he said, the only Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And the wages of sin is death. It's the wage of sin. We've all earned it. Don't look at somebody and go, man, you're in trouble. We're all in trouble. The wage of sin is death. And so God prepared a way to begin to explain to a people who couldn't understand his love, who couldn't grasp the depth of God, who really couldn't capture him in our own mind. He began to show us through the priesthood of how to deal with sin was the blood. And the Bible says that the priests would get ready to bring the atonement, bring the blood into the Holy of Holies before God. And before they did it for you, they had to do it for them. Right? They were men, they were sinners, and before they could make sacrifice for you, they had to make sacrifice for themselves. And then they make sacrifice for themselves, and then they'd have to go in before God for you. He said, but we have a high priest, a high priest who had no need for sacrifice. He did not have to sacrifice. He had no purpose. There was no reason for him to have to sacrifice. He didn't have to do it. There was no sin in him. There was nothing in him that would ever mean that he would have to sacrifice. And so going in and sacrificing brought him nothing except pain. And he only did it to be the one high priest who could sacrifice truly and once for all for you. Why would a good broad bring suffering? Why would a most powerful God with the only God, why would such a good God choose to suffer for me? That's the question. Why would a good God suffer for me? Because he is good all the time. <laughs> because God is good all the time. Because he loves me. And I'm still going to go through hardships. I'm still going to experience sorrow. I'm still going to see loved ones die. I'm still going to experience pain. I'm going to have hardships. I'm going to experience all of those things. But my God loved me so dearly that he is willing to experience those with me and become a high priest, not touched with sin, but still touched with sorrow. Never touched with sin, but still touched with sorrow. <laughs> because he is a good, good God. In our lives, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know some of you. I don't know you at all. But I'm going to tell you something. The end of all things will come. Judgment will come. And God will set everything right. But if you're not right with him, you should rejoice that he is not doing it right now. If your heart is not right with him, you should be glad yesterday wasn't judgment day. And you should say, why is there still suffering in the world? And you should say, glory be to God so that I can get my heart right today. So that today I can set my life right with him. So today I can put myself together why is there suffering in the world? Because God is waiting. God's waiting. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Not because you've removed our sorrow, because you didn't come yet to do that. Oh, you're coming to do that. And you're going to remove every tear. You're going to heal every infirmity. You are going to bring completeness. You're going to do away with death. But with it comes the judgment of God upon all those who have rejected you. You can't have one without the other. And the judgment of God will also fall on that glorious, glorious day. 
Therefore, at this time, I thank you for the time that we live, the mercy of God that is still waiting for those people, those sinners, those people who have not come home to you, that they would receive you as their Savior, that they would find you, that they would learn of you, that they would receive you, have their sins washed away by the only priest to not deserve to sacrifice, but to do it for us anyway. A God willing to suffer for me. God, I ask you right now to send this word out. And I don't know where you are. If you're in what, I don't know what country you're in. We, 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 these messages go out to many countries. And I don't know where you are right now. I don't know what's going on in your life. But if you have not accepted Christ, the redemption of God, the Savior who paid for your sins, then today is your day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Listen. Next time somebody says to you, why would a good God allow suffering? Do you have a question for them? Why would the most powerful being ever choose to suffer for you? Because that's a bigger question. Why would he choose to suffer? That's a much bigger question. God bless you. Have a great day. Listen, if you'd like prayer, I'm going to be up here for a little bit. I'd love to pray with you. Um, if you don't know Christ, if, you, if, you're, if your life is not right with God, let's get it right right now. Don't wait. Judgment Day is coming. I don't know when, but it's coming. God bless you. Have a great day.